So to try to be very specific about exactly what yoga is, exactly what spirituality is, what what is one working with? What is one engaging with? What is one trying to achieve? <clears throat> um, simplistically, one can look at a, a, a scale going from reality, actuality, uh, as one extreme value and delusion or confusion or unreality or um, insanity being lost in fantasy at the other extreme value of the scale. <clears throat> now, humans seem to engage with the reality of their being along the scale. <clears throat> um, so concretely, what does what constitutes delusion? What is delusion made of? What does delusion look like? And conversely, what does reality look like? What does realization look like? What does um, actuality look like? <clears throat> well, delusion looks like concretizing the qualities of experience. In other words. Um, in other words, supposing that something exists that is a certain way. So, I'm in this room and this room actually exists. I'm looking at this computer and this computer actually exists. It's a concrete, objective, um, solid object that exists in an objective space-time continuum that is stably that is solidly that, is undeniably that. Um, for example, um, this is what delusion looks like. It concretizes and stabilizes. It, it, it approaches the continuum of experience, or the whatever of experience, the field of experience, let's call it, um, as if it was, as if it consisted of findable, somehow definable, somehow identifiable, stable objects or conditions. <clears throat> Actuality, on the other hand, reality, on the other hand, is entirely unresolvable. Um, unresolvable is a, a very subtle and profound <laughs> notion. But what that looks like is um, you can't tell what anything is. You can't pin anything down. You can't find any stability. You can't find any concretization. You can't find anything that actually is findably a certain way um, with certainty. In other words, it's, it's, it's slipperiness to the power of slipperiness. It's completely open-ended. It's completely... Um, well, and it, it, as soon as you try to... It's, it's, it's very subtle, because as soon as you try and put these label, these notions on, even these subtle notions, you're subtly concretizing it. So even saying it's unresolvable, all of a sudden you're positing this unresolvability as some, you know, para-concrete <laughs> condition that is findable, that, that, that actually exists. Um, and so... So that would so that would still be on the continuum. That would be moving slightly towards the delusion side. You know, even saying that it's slippery, saying that it's unfindable, saying that it's unresolvable, saying that it's dreamlike is all very nice. But it's still on the delude towards the delusion side because you're concretizing it to that degree. Obviously, that's a, a much less heavy-handed concretizing than perhaps the normal materialistic worldview that we can imagine. Uh, most people um, relate to of you know uh, uh, living in an objective solid world and and so on and so forth. <coughs> so this so this is the actuality that one is working with and one's experience in terms of yoga. So a red flag is anything that seems like something, anything that seems to be a certain way, anything that seems to 
to be anything um, in the broadest possible terms. And, of course, typically for most of us, that's clearly obvious. <laughs> things, things seem to be <laughs> whatever. Computer seems to be a computer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> people seem to be people. So, you know, my body seems to be my body, and so on and so forth. But the yogi looks at this very closely and looks at the actuality of experience and discovers the slipperiness of experience, discovers the absolute instantaneous instability of experience, discovers that any and all experiential qualities don't actually cohere into being a certain findable, precise way. It's all innuendo, it's all implication. Mind you, it's an infinite density, it's an in inconceivable um, uh, 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 potency of implication and innuendo. So obviously there's, a, there's such a, a shitload of information that is being presented as, um, as experiential qualities um, that it's very, very easy to free associate on that as being various ways. But the, the yogi looks very closely at these experiential qualities and notices their, their essential nature of, not, of, of having implication of being a certain way while it's not actually being findable as actually being that way. Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, the closer you look, the more precisely you look at experiential characteristics, the more obvious it is that they aren't the way that they, they seem to be superficially. <clears throat> um, or they don't resolve ultimately to precisely being that way. Um, uh, and so this is the this is this is the, the concrete nature, this is the actual nature of what the yogi is working with, is being with um, the degree of of one's laziness at having settled into a concretized view of what is of what reality uh, consists of. Um, and challenging that, looking at that, and, and discovering more and more carefully, more and more precisely, um, exactly how that is, and exactly um, how that works, and exactly what this concretization is. And if the yogi brings sufficient um, intelligence and good fortune to this investigation, um, they will notice that as they look, at the actuality of experience, it, they just, this, this is, this is a, a, a really very palpable discovery that um, it's not quite like that, that, that things are subtle, that things are slippery, that things are floating, that things are difficult to pin down. And one looks at this difficulty to pin down and discovers that even that is difficult to pin down. How it is, even that, that it is slippery is slippery. Even that it is unresolvable is unresolvable. So it's not like one ever gets to, um, in any simple sense, reality, because reality can actually be found. But one gets to the fact that that is the case. The fact that one is essentially wandering in uh, what might be described as a dream that, that has endless implication, um, endless information, and yet never actually settles down um, verifiably as being any particular way. Um, so the so the, the the father the raw the raw material of yoga is really very very simple and very precise. It all has to do with this issue of concretization, um, and and so. In practice, what does the yogi do? You can look at anything that seems to be a certain way in one's experience. Anything, in, in, in any way. It doesn't need to be a heavy-handed concretization or objectification uh, as an object in, or a condition in an objective world. Any even subtle, very, very subtle um, objectification or, 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 or stabilization of 
you know, intelligence is intelligence, or consciousness is consciousness, or any, you know, whatever. You know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, if if the yogi looks at this, one will see that in fact, every and anything that is being held to be something is actually a question mark. You can't actually find anything. Nothing is findable. Which means there are no things. There are no static conditions. There are no. Um, Nothing whatsoever exists, um, you know, and, and as, as no thing exists, no condition exists. Um, existence exists, um, uh, but but again, you go try and find an existence and try and find an existence that exists. That's it's in itself is a subtle objectification, and of course you won't find any such thing. But it's 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 palpable that it is. <laughs> However, it is, and 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 even if that isness is a <laughs> is unfindable, it's um, it is its own intrinsic positivity, whatever that means. <clears throat> um, so one is one is always in the midst of this very curious, um, you know, one is always standing at this fork of the roads of of the way things seem to be versus the fact that all of these ways things seem to be is not actually findable, is not actually resolvable. There's always seemings, there's always there's endless implications, but these implications by their very nature are unstable, unfindable, and unresolvable as actually being any particular way. Um, so um, this is the essential issue in spirituality in yoga and this is the the specific um, of what is being uh, dealt with what is being looked at um, so anyway um, I'd, uh, I welcome discussion with anybody that is interested and, and, and uh, you know in, in terms of these kinds of discussions questions come up oriented around um, illustrate this exact issue. They come up oriented around something that someone thinks is an issue, is the case, is a, a basically by implication a certain way. And, you know, the point is always to look at that and discover that it's not that way. So one is continually pulling the rug out from under oneself of whatever way um, one is holding things to be, one is, whatever conditions one is one is holding as existent. <clears throat> and, of course, all entrapment, all stuckness, all unsatisfactoriness, and all, all, and, and all hope for improvement, all, hope, all aspiration for something better and all that, is all, is all essentially based upon the notion that of, of resolvability, the notion of that things are a certain way. For things to be unsatisfactory, you have to there have to be things, and they have to be find, resolvable as actually being unsatisfactory. And to hope for improvement, you have to posit some improved condition that actually exists and is that, and that, and that, and that there would be some possibility of motion or engagement with it. But of course, the yogi will ultimately discover that nothing like any of that is remotely possible. What actuality is, what this is here, is extremely strange. It's extremely weird, um, in, intrinsically in its nature of what it is, which makes it impossible to talk about um, and impossible to describe. <clears throat> and generally, this is why I prefer to work with people on the basis of um, dealing with their in, with their individual perspectives, um, rather than trying to launch into broad general descriptions, um, or you know, um, uh, it turns out to be preambles um, that su that supposedly present <laughs> a panoramic view of what is going on here and what spirituality is and all of that. Um, which is always hogwash, um, never accurate, possibly useful, 
Um, but uh, intrinsically um, very awkward and and um, and and essentially uh, misleading. <clears throat> But uh, in general, a, a, a good jumping off point is to, is to start with noticing how very, very, very peculiar, how very, very, very strange and weird this actuality is. <clears throat> of course, that flies in the face of the skill with which, the skillfulness with which we've turned it into dull normalcy and complacency and taking it all for granted and just thinking of it as. <laughs> as uh, normal and, and mundane. <laughs> um, which is an aspect of its weirdness that it, that it can that it can manifest itself like that, that it can appear to be this that is so intrinsically bizarre. <laughs> can appear to be boring and normal and mundane is astounding it's just another another facet of its astoundingness <clears throat> mm. but in practical terms the main point is what occurs here what this is is radically other than what you may hold it to be um, so the very nature of normalcy, the very nature of this dullness that we settle into in, in our, in our, you know, holding, you know, life, life is life and it's, you know, and it's boring and what's on TV kind of attitude. <laughs> uh, uh, it, what it, this is is so radically um, alien to anything that can seem to be uh, in that way. Um, and this is noticeable, this is discoverable, and that, of course, is the jumping off point for discovering and recognizing what it actually is, um, which it happens, of course, is actually doable, hence this, this great enterprise of, of, of spiritual um, inquiry, what was called back in, alch in alchemical days, the great work, um, is actually viable, is actually doable, is an actuality. Actuality is the only thing that matters. Actuality is the only power, the only importance. And the nature of actuality is that it is fundamentally and radically different than we think of it as being. Um, however, fortunately, actuality is not concealed. So, anyone has the possibility of engaging with it directly and learning the way in which it is what it is and discovering the way in which what it is is intrinsically, radically other than it is thought to be. <coughs> this is always the case um, because actuality is unthinkable. It cannot be accurately resolved to a concept or a thought or an idea or a measurement. It's intrinsically transcendental. <clears throat> it transcends rationality. It transcends um, analysis. It transcends resolution. <clears throat> it transcends even findability. But of course it never goes away, so you don't need to find it. The reason why authentic spirituality is so difficult is as though there were two different things going on simultaneously that basically have nothing to do with each other. Um, and yet, typically, we assume they do, we expect them to, we think that it does. Um, which is uh, a disastrous and 
completely confusing and befuddling mistake. Because in fact they have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. These two things are, on the one hand, this, this actuality. Um, in a way, the less said about it, the better. You all know it intimately. In fact, you all know absolutely nothing but it, because there's nothing but it to know. It alone exists. Everything, if there was any things um, that exists whatsoever, is this that is here. <coughs> <clears throat> However, the fly in the ointment is this seeming otherness. Um, and what it is and how it is what it is is unfathomably strange and not graspable because, of course, what it actually is is this itself, which is unfathomably strange and not graspable. <clears throat> but this other pretends to be graspable it seems to be graspable it consists of what, what seems to be the human urge to analyze the human urge to get a handle on things the human urge to figure out what's going on to describe, to name, to designate to plan uh, to, to deconstruct and structuralize and so on and so forth. We're all very familiar with that. You know, and these words on, on a superficial level are evidence of that. <clears throat> From this other perspective, this perspective of, call it human analysis, um, that's, that's all language seems to be. Language is the pretense of, I'm saying these words, and these words somehow semi-relevantly refer to some actuality with some accuracy, with some relevance. Um, that's the pretense. From, the, from this second perspective of, of human analysis, of human conceptualization, that's all bread and butter. That makes perfect sense. It's completely obvious. <clears throat> the fly in the ointment is it's completely untrue. It's not like that at all. Um, so your typical spiritual aspirant naturally approaches this and tries to figure out what's going on. You know, that makes perfect sense. It stands to reason. That's what you do. You try and figure out what's going on, right? That's how do you learn something? You figure out what's going on. <clears throat> Which, of course tends to full-on engage the second mode, the second perspective, um, which is unfortunately entirely inaccurate and irrelevant um, in the terms in which it pretends to be accurate and relevant. <laughs> <coughs> mm. So this is a challenge. <laughs> This is a, uh, an interesting uh, conundrum that the very vehicle of analysis through which one tries to approach this is completely incapable of approaching this and completely incapable of grasping this, completely incapable of indicating this with any accuracy whatsoever. <coughs> and this can be... It can be difficult to come to see that. It can be difficult to come to, to perceive the way in which this is so. Um, because again, typically, one is fully engaged to whatever degree in this mode of supposition that there is um, logic, there is structure, there is, you know, meaningful engagement in symbolic and conceptual terms. <clears throat> um, so basically one is stymied until such time as one has the insight 
of the degree to which this is not the case. <laughs> what is going on here is unfathomably weird and unfathomably strange from the point of view of this secondary perspective of analysis. <clears throat> Another aspect of this conundrum, this sort of bifurcation of modes, this, this doubleness of modes, is that this, this engagement in terms of analysis, in terms of trying to understand and trying to get a handle on things, um, uh, is, it proceeds and is engaged with on levels of, of, of progressive degrees of subtlety progressive degrees of unconsciousness, progressive degrees of, of, of assumption of it to be true, um, without um, clarity that it's not. So, for example, you, it's possible to do a really, a really powerful analysis or discovery of the irrelevance of a lot of analysis and so on and so forth, but there will typically tend to still be subtle ways in which one is assuming that, you know, sort of it's like keeping a, a secret stash, you know, assuming that there's some, there's some level at which I can still have a handle on things, I can still have some sense of what things are. And, and so typically one who is looking into this will butt up against these unconscious orientations um, unbeknownst and, and been stuck with them. <clears throat> the simple fact is there is no orientation. Period. In the strongest possible terms. So, any kind of an orientation, any kind of holding things to be some way, or some certain, some particular way, whatsoever, no matter how subtly, is untrue, is inaccurate, is wrong, is not the case. <clears throat> Which is, in a way, very um, useful, because for the yogi who is looking into this, for the yogi who is on this path, um, that gives a nice little red flag of, of where, to, where to dig, where to work. You know, you, you have a, a nice convenient indicator of, of where you're screwing up, so to speak, <laughs> by anything that seems to be anything. <laughs> In the broadest possible sense, anything that seems to be anything anything that seems to be something, anything that seems to be any particular way, but in the broadest possible strokes, um, is not. Um, actuality is, has absolutely no positions, it has no orientations, it is entirely and completely um, inconceivable, ungraspable, unresolvable as being any particular way. Which is a very alien mode to normal human thought. It's a very alien mode to normal human orientation. And so, essentially, this path um, consists of the discovery that one is not a human being. That human beings aren't human beings. Because, of course, human humanness human beinghood is itself a concept, is itself an orientation that does not actually exist. You know, what you are cannot be said. It's absolutely inconceivable. But it doesn't need to be said because it's right here, completely actualized, completely explicitly revealed, plain to see. <clears throat> as long as you don't hold it to be, any particular way, at all. And paradoxically, even if you do hold it to be 
some particular way, it still isn't that, and it still is plainly revealed. So, this situation is, is most peculiar because the actual condition is never concealed. The actual condition is already completely realized, it's already completely known, it's already been completely engaged with, and there is no alternative, there's nothing else. There is no non-actuality. It cannot be present. Only actuality exists. Actuality is actual. And anything that wasn't actual, if there, which is a total fantasy, <laughs> is obviously not actual, so it's not a thing. <laughs> and of course, this is all, already always being fully engaged with, there being no alternative. And even all of the confusion and conundrum and misorientation generated by analysis and the fantasy of resolvability, the fantasy that it is possible to get a handle on something, and all the subsequent handle getting that follows from that, um, is itself nothing other than this actuality. It's being done by this actuality, it consists of this actuality, but it of course is not what it seems to be from the perspective of this analytical mode, from the perspective of this, this mode of um, supposing that you can have a clue. <laughs> so this is the conundrum. Um, how to see what you're already seeing, how to realize what you've already realized, and especially how to f let go of the fact that you are continually misapprehending it from the unending bullshit spinning of human mentality, which never stops. I mean, a realized yogi doesn't stop thinking, doesn't stop being a complete idiot. This is inherent in the nature of human personality, which seems to be an inherent aspect of the way actuality shows up in this particular bardo. <clears throat> um, so it's a, so realization is a very strange condition. Um, realization is a condition of um, a, a deluded idiot running around thinking they have a clue in the context of and consisting entirely of a completely transhuman, transcendental actuality that is always explicitly present and revealed. <laughs> so, you know, a, a realization could be said to be a very kind of a schizophrenic actuality. And the fantasy, of course, of the aspirant is you're going to move from this to that. You're going to move from, you know, deluded analysis into transcendental openness and and revelation, but this is not the case. You don't ever get to leave delusion behind. Delusion is an aspect of reality, one of the major aspects of reality. Reality itself is a confusion, it's a noise generator, it's a confusion generator. It, 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 it endlessly spins off um, erroneous implications of itself, and basically that's all it's doing. <clears throat> so all of this information that bombards your sensoria and your experiential field, um, that seems to be the basis for supposing that things exist and situations exist and, and events are happening and so on and so forth, um, is being done by actuality, it consists of nothing but actuality, and in fact does not come together into actually being the things and events and conditions that it may seem to imply to this analytical mood. So, delusion and confusion is the very present revelation and display of actuality. You know, which is, which is uh, why actuality is not um, no, it's not why, but it is evidence, further evidence or, or fundamental evidence of the way in which actuality is not resolvable, it's not graspable. Because 
something that is not actually any particular some way is obviously not actually graspable as being that way. And actuality is no way, even though it's generating an infinite continual field of implications that it is infinite ways. <clears throat> you know, and of course we're all very familiar how 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 effortlessly the consciousness seizes on these implications and virtually actualizes them and, and all of a sudden through a sort of this hypnotic mechanism it seems like you're a person living in a world with a life and a history and all the complexities and problems and life sucks and what am I going to do about it? All of which is just innuendo and implication of transcendental, completely incoherent um, subtle energy which alone exists, which alone is present. I subtitled the book that I wrote um, The Inherent Perfection of Imperfection. And um, this is of the essence of um, what this yoga is about. In, 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 in the basic practical terms, it's not a matter of changing anything, it's a matter of seeing what things are. Um, and this can be, in practice, this can be a very um, subtle thing because it's really easy to have a subliminal notion that there's something to achieve or some perfection to to acquire or or some you know imperfection to eliminate uh, and so on and so forth and. This is most emphatically not the case. <clears throat> Simply seeing what anything is, you, you see what everything is. And when you see what everything is, it is revealed that its intrinsic nature is absolutely um, astounding and completely beyond <clears throat> um, improving or, or tainting or <laughs> the, uh, as, as I say over and over, the fundamental issue is not um, coming to see what reality is so much as it is seeing that our presuppositions or our, our notions about what it is, our feeling about what anything is, is completely and utterly inaccurate. <clears throat> so all, all suffering, all human suffering, um, all sense of, of unsatisfactoriness or dissatisfaction is based in this we miss it. We interpret things as being unsatisfactory, things as being um, uh, frustrating. Whereas in actuality, nothing is like that whatsoever. And so the the solution to all of these apparent problems is simply to see what this is, to see the inherent perfection of apparent imperfection. And then, of course, you discover that there is no imperfection, there is no problems, there is no unsatisfactoriness. There's just essentially what might be called <coughs> unending weirdness. <laughs> and um, this is the condition, this is the soul condition, this is your condition, this is what you are and what your universe is. And, um, you know, it's important to understand, it's important to come to see that this can be seen with absolute clarity and absolute self-verifying um, revelation. It's, it's, it's not a vague or subtle or philosophical notion that one needs to aspire to or, or, uh, or maintain or try to come to educate oneself in. On the contrary, this, what this is is in completely what it is, absolutely revealed, completely obvious, and that it is inconceivable and completely beyond <laughs> um, conception and resolution is blatantly obvious. 
<laughs> and as one comes to see uh, what anything is and sees the, the incredible absurdity of one's notions of what things are, one becomes free of those notions as, as being relevant. They may, they may or may not disappear <laughs> because the mind is an unending fountain of perversion. <laughs> but um, it becomes irrelevant, you know, when it comes to see that this, what this is is completely beyond anything that can be thought. And so all of these thoughts about it, all these feelings about it that, 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 are, that are assessments of ourselves, our assessments of our life, our assessments of our status, our assessments of, you know, whether we're happy or sad and everything are based on, um, are completely absurd, completely essentially um, irrelevant and non-existent. <clears throat> In effect, when one, as one comes to see what this is, the effect is one of relaxing, <coughs> um, of letting go into it, um, rather than ascending to some superior condition or something. On the contrary, it was a condition of relaxation, non-resistance. But again, but it's not some simulated relaxation or simulated non-resistance that one aspires to or attempts to create. On the contrary, when one sees what this is, the relaxation and the non-resistance is implicit because there's nothing to <laughs> there's nothing to not relax into. There's nothing to, to try to tense against, and uh, <laughs> so on. <laughs> mm. So simply seeing, simply seeing is absolutely sufficient, um, and. It happens that what this is is of a is of a nature that uh, it <laughs> discovering what it is reveals um, s sufficiency and 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 beauty and joy beyond your wildest fantasies. The only fact is the appearance of apparent experiential patterns, um, apparent forms. Of course, as humans, we're used to classifying all of these apparent forms in various ways as self and other and beings and objects and, you know, dreams and emotion and... Um, light and I mean and, you know any take out a dictionary and pull out all the words and every one of them is a classification of some supposed class of the way these experiential patternings can seem to appear <clears throat> um, but what's aside from all of this classification which we're all very familiar with <clears throat> um, what's interesting is w what these patterns are Intrinsically, experientially, and their 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 mode of appearing, their mode of functioning, what they what they how they appear, um, what they're made of, all, all these all these kinds of questions, <clears throat> every aspect of that. So, it, all of the any all and any issue whatsoever <clears throat> is entirely about the appearance, the apparent appearance of these experiential patterns. There's no other topic that is, could be considered because there's no other there's no other quality there's no other fact that exists. <clears throat> In looking at these apparent experiential patterns, um, one discovers that they have some very interesting properties that are not usually taken into account in in our normal classification scheme. Um, some of these include um, unresolvability. In other words, you cannot precisely pin down what any apparent pattern actually is, the way it is, what the actual pattern is precisely. Um, 
Um, also, the patterns have no duration. They have, they actually, they actually, uh, they seem to be appearing, but they have absolutely no time whatsoever that they are any particular way. They're continually morphing um, into apparent otherness <coughs> eternally. And most, and one of the most interesting characteristics is that <coughs> the patterns themselves. Um, well, this is one. This is a subtle aspect to talk about. Um, the patterns themselves appear within being, within actuality, or you could say, within or out of or consisting of actuality, consisting of this presence that is here. Um, you, you, you certainly know that I. I refer to this this fundamental actuality as radiant presence. The presence refers to obviously what this presence, this this isness, this being that 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 this undeniably is actual, where that whatever that <laughs> means, <coughs> and this actual <coughs> it's the nature of this actuality to continually um, present as these apparent patternings. The patternings arise within this actuality, exist solely within this actuality to the extent they do exist, and of course continually disappear within this actuality, continually morph within this actuality, and are made of nothing other than the actuality itself. In other words, it's not like there's an actuality here and then patterns are somehow appearing over here as a result of it, but the patterns are the the actuality very much in the same way that uh, a, a, the the contents and apparent objects and events of a dream are the dreaming? The dreaming is interpreted as consisting of oh I'm in this world and various things are happening and so on and so forth. But actually, all of these, all of this supposed event, all of the supposed complexity and interrelationship of these supposed pattern entities. Um, is nothing other than dreaming itself. So the only thing actually there is dreaming, um, in spite of the fact of all of this seeming complexity appearing. And in precisely the same way, the only thing that's here is the radiant presence, is the presence itself, which by its very nature presents itself to itself as all of this apparent, intricate, infinitely intricate um, and unresolvable patterning. Um, that is uh, unceasing, <laughs> eternal, beyond space and time, and yet it appears seemingly perhaps as space and time can be interpreted as consisting of that. But of course, none of those um, qualities can actually be found, just as no quality whatsoever can actually be found, um, which is um, more evidence of the intrinsic unresolvability of this that is here, of, of what this actually is. It's a very strange condition, and of course we're all very familiar with it. We may not be used to noticing how strange it is, <laughs> because there's all of this completely obvious experiential qualities and characteristics continually appearing, and yet none of them can be precisely pinned down as to exactly what they are, exactly how they are. Um, and we're, we're expert and used to glossing over that and just, just assuming that, well, it's there, you know, my shirt's blue. Who cares if I can't pin down that it's blue? It is blue. It's obviously blue, so move on, you know. Then do you like it? Do you not? Do you want to buy it? You know, what, whatever. <laughs> um, but all of these normal human concerns skip over the very interesting properties of these apparitional patterns, which in fact are the sole thing that's actually here. Objects are, uh, a hy are hypothetical. Objects are a supposition. I can suppose that this is a computer that is, that is sitting here on my lap, but in fact all it is is a, is a, is a pattern appearing in light, a pattern appearing in, in the field of touch where, where, it's, where what I call it sits on my legs is appearing and so on and so forth. So all of this theoretical projection of these patterns as being actual 
is imaginary, whereas the patterns themselves are not imaginary in a simple in any simple sense. <clears throat> the patterns themselves are actual. Radiant presence is actual, um, and nothing else is actual whatsoever. The 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 facility of being able to project on the basis of these apparent patterns all of the and populate all of this all of the details of the world we imagine we ex we exist in and objectivity and objects and other beings and our own being and our own body and our own personality <clears throat> all of this is intrinsic in simply this root this basic fact the sole fact of radiant presence the sole fact of actuality appearing intrinsically as an infinite degree of patterning <clears throat> so the, the imagination is just more patterning Interpretation is just more patterning. You know, personality and emotions and reactivity is just more patterning. All of this is nothing other than the root fact, and, and then it's interpreted as if all of these nuances exist in their own right and exist autonomously and interact causally um, and, and complexly with each other, <clears throat> all of which is pure fantasy, which is itself radiant presence. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing departs from, nothing adds to this fundamental fact of radiant presence and all the apparent complexity uh, out of which we construct our, our seeming lives is nothing other than this root fact. <clears throat> so of course spirituality um, is the discovery of and the noticing of and the exploration of this root fact because of course there's nothing else to discover or explore. In this process, spirituality is a lot like separating the weed from the shaft. It's a, it's a lot like discovering what is actually here versus what we're used to thinking is here. <clears throat> it turns out that um, all of our problems, all of our difficulties come from what we think is here. Um, which turns out to be misinterpretations of what's actually here. And simply discovering what's actually here um, has the delightful side effect of essentially solving all problems, or let's say eliminating them as being problems. <laughs> so it's essentially a reality check. What is actually here? What is actually here? Now, ordinarily, normal human mode, Perhaps people think in terms of all the conditions and events and history and objects and environment and beings they think exist in their lives and their own their own self and their personality and their body and their history and all these various categories and elaborations that are more or less held to be here, held to be actual, and which typically present as a as a complexity. Um, that often presents uh, as challenges or ambiguities that um, that can, be, can can present as conundrums, can present as as um, potential uh, difficulties or certainly challenges. <coughs> um, but it happens that virtually none of the categories that people ordinarily relate to as being actual in their experience actually exist as such. Um, by and large, most categories that humans are concerned with, which includes virtually all conditions or objects that it's possible to refer to by words of any type, um, don't actually exist in the way that the definitions of the words uh, imply that they do. <coughs> What does actually exist is completely obvious and in fact um, is continually being engaged with all the time because of course it does exist and in fact it alone exists. Um, but by its very nature it's amenable to a misinterpretation which gives rise to all this conundrums and misunderstandings that our normal human approach to things um, uh, implies. <coughs> Thank you.
this that is here is, it is actual. Um, this is pretty self-evident. <coughs> um, this being is concrete. It is not an abstraction. It is um, It is also inclusive and comprehensive. There's only one being here. There's not the being of this and the being of this and the being of that and the being of this and the being of this and the being of that. There's one being. You could think of it as a field of being if you like, but there's one being and anything and everything which may be thought to appear or exist within experience actually is uh, this one being this one isness, this one presence. Um, this presence is clearly your presence. Um, if you look at this being, if you look at this presence, you'll discover some interesting aspects of it. One is that it has de no demarcations. It has no boundaries. It has no um, separation. And also it has no edges. It has no end. It has no limit. <coughs> Um, this is a little bit contrary to normal human thought where we're used to thinking perhaps, you know, my being is, and then the, there's the being of the universe, and the being of the universe is bigger than my being, and my being is some little piece of that that exists within that and is subject to that and dependent upon it. And, you know, of course, this basic view is where all the problems arise because if my being is in this universal being, then what's the relationship? What do we do? How do I make it work? How do I get money and get food and get social status or whatever? So all these conundrums are presented in this juxtaposition of separation, of my being is separate, my being is dependent. But this is contrary to the actual evidence of experience. If you look at experience, you, it's quite plain to see that, experience, that the being of experience is a continuum. It does not have demarcations, it doesn't have breaks, it doesn't have um, uh, divisions. Um, <coughs> and in this context, uh, your being is very self-evident. It's quite obvious that you are. If I said you don't exist, you would you would say you're nuts. That's absurd. Of course I exist. I, it's self-evident. You know, I, I may not be able to prove it, but it's it's <laughs> it's the it's the one thing that is most self-evident and self-verifying. My being, or in your case, your being, you are, you exist. And if you look at this isness, if you look at this aureness that you are you'll discover that every single thing that you've ever experienced and everything that you experience appears within your isness. So you are, and this room is, but the room is because it appears within your isness. The idea that the room is separately is fine, but it's just an idea, and that idea may exist within your isness, if it's there or not. But you cannot find a separate room that has its own being. You cannot find a separate world that has its own being. Other people also, interestingly, exist within your own isness. So, I am, and all of this is that same I am, that same being, that same presence, that same undeniable fact of existence. <clears throat> um, and you know this is not an abstraction if, if you look at this um, if you feel this directly um, you'll probably notice that this is quite self-evident <clears throat> but it has, a, it has a profound implication because if my isness my being is the only isness that's, that's findable then and it has no findable edges or limits has no boundaries, has no walls, and there's no point where it stops, where I can find where it stops, then where is there separation? Where is there a world outside? You know, um, and everything that occurs within the field of isness 
the field of presence occurs at the same time, occurs spontaneously, occurs in the same mode. My hand appears exactly the same as this room appears, exactly the same as the thoughts that may be in my mind appears, all right here, right now, in, in, a, in, in inclusiveness, without any division. Now, of course, as I was saying, you know, as people who are all very familiar with the normal mode of slicing and dicing and classifying all of these separate categories of, of experience of presence as if they were separate from each other. But again, this is an abstraction. This is a, an abstract notion. It's an idea. And this cannot be found in the actual immediate concrete fact of experience. Experience itself is inclusive. Experience includes everything that appears in it as one field, as one event, as one spontaneous, um, instantaneous apparition, you might say. <clears throat> and that feels very different. The feeling tone of what that feels like is very, very different than the, the normal human mo the normal human world view of all these <laughs> separate things and separate people and separate worlds and this little old me over here and there's a big big world over there and how am I going to sort out juggling with it and, and getting through it whereas the presence of experiential field as a unity as an inclusive <coughs> continuum simply ongoingly <coughs> unfolds itself ongoingly presents itself. Um, and of course, this, is, this has been your experience all your life, I'm sure. If you look, you'll recognize this fact that your entire experience just appears and then continues to appear and, and continually new events and configurations and qualities continue to appear. But it never gains anything, it never loses anything. It never becomes more experience or less experience. It's an absolute constant, just this present field. Um, what it looks like, of course, changes continually. And that's another very interesting aspect of it, if you look very closely. Um, you can't, even though it's quite obvious what things look like, and when I say look, that implies in the visual field, but of course, uh, any kind of experience, you know, uh, <clears throat> thought or sound or touch or whatever is analogous <coughs> or extrasensory experience that can't be correlated to any kind of a sense field. <coughs> um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> so, um, uh, that's, uh, that's a good riddance. <laughs> Anyway, this is just a you know a rough overview of some aspects of this actuality that is here that is not often stressed or, pre or presented um, within a human context. We're usually very busy talking about this and that and what's going on here and what's going on there and what to do about it and so on and so forth. But what what it itself, what it is in itself, what it is that is appearing here in its most basic and inclusive sense, is not something that um, people customarily often take the time to look at. Good morning. The operative principle in um, in the result of spirituality, in the result of any um, 
understanding is implication. Um, the implication of what it feels to you like a situation is, is the resultant context within which you will feel you exist, and where you, what you will feel you are, and what you will feel is happening. Um, Implication is uh, um, subtle because it's indirect. You can't deal with implication directly. Um, but what you can deal with directly is the information that that is that is the basis of the implication. Um, and it's this implication that that gets one into trouble. It's the implication that motivates the spiritual inquiry. It's the implication that um, creates a seeming unsatisfactoriness or a seeming difficulty or a seeming incompleteness or a seeming lack of fulfillment um, that one hopes to remedy through some kind of spiritual or philosophical inquiry, investigation, discovery. Um, and in fact, such a discovery can be effective, that discovery can um, achieve results whose implication is completely satisfactory. Because it happens that what is actually happening here um, is uh, astounding in its implication by comparison with what consensus reality, frame of reference, generally creates as its implication, which is <laughs> very unsatisfactory in many regards in terms of our ideas of our social situation, our ideas of our failing, you know, our failing biosphere, our, you know, all these various implications that we think are um, occurring and are relevant and are, and are more or less crappy, um, or at least problematic, um, as well as our individual lifespans, our, our, our problematic social situations, our problematic health, our problematic aging and going to die soon, and then what? <laughs> and all of these various other issues that are sort of hang, that hang over you as question marks, as, as oh my God, this, you know, what, what's up with this? What's going on with this? <coughs> Talking about spirituality, there's really no point in talking about um, what it is, what reality is, what the goal is, so to speak, what the finish line is, what the completeness is, because it, it cannot be talked about, and it's also already the case, and and there's no need to understand it or talk about it. The, the relevant the relevant situation in spirituality is the problem, um, which essentially consists of misinformation. And it's not a matter of substituting correct information for misinformation, it's a matter of removing the misinformation, because it, as it happens, reality itself is its own information which cannot be communicated secondhand. It cannot be communicated through symbols or through words. So, it, and it need not be communicated because it is already completely revealed immediately and imminently um, in the simple presence of your being. <coughs> and the only thing that can blind you to the fact of this astounding revelation is um, absorption and being caught up in misinformation. 
which is unfortunately seems to be the typical human condition. Um, <coughs> um, humans seem to be largely brainwashed by uh, various consensus reality worldviews, which are which are inculcated by you know the upbringing and by the structure of language and by um, reinforcement through through being continually bombarded with social information that seems to be self-reinforcing of this world fear. <coughs> um, so it's, um, it's really, a, it's essentially an issue of brainwashing. It's an issue of having been, having been convinced that things are a certain way, and then one is stuck with the implication of that way that is being held to be true. If things were that way, then the implications are such, such and such, which implies various problems and difficulties and issues, and, uh, and here we are. And this is more or less a, a, perhaps the typical um, human perspective, the typical human uh, frame of reference of what seems to be happening and what one feels one is, what one feels one life, one's life is, and what one feels one's environment is. <clears throat> um, and um, consensus reality is astoundingly and completely and utterly wrong. It's inaccurate. It's just not true. Um, and one of the one of the obstacles to to um, clearly seeing what this is is how divergent what this is, is from consensus reality. So in most cases, if someone tells someone else how it is, they'll, they won't believe it. They'll go, you're kidding me, you know, can't be that. this is absurd. That's like, that's like, you know, it's way, that's beyond Easter Bunny and Santa Claus all in one, you know? I mean, it's, it makes, um, you know, it makes, it makes religious stories and miracles look, look commonplace. <laughs> compared to what's what is actually occurring here. <clears throat> so there's a there's a one has to come to see for oneself. One has to discover um, directly um, through investigation of one's own, or whether it, through investigation or through stumbling upon through some kind of a process of direct revelation, um, what one actually is, what one's being actually is, um, which of course conveys its own, it self-verifyingly reveals its own nature, and self-verifyingly of course conveys its own implication, which constitutes what has been called liberation, realization, enlightenment, all these wonderful, glorious sounding terms that, that um, have been put forth in various spiritual traditions. <coughs> <clears throat> which simply is the implication of the actual condition, the implication of reality itself, not some reality in capital letters that's out there somewhere that you fight your way to, but this reality that is, the sole reality, the only reality that ever has been. <clears throat> um, so the issue is not finding reality, the issue is letting go of unreality, dispelling misinformation, you know, convincing and relatively, um, seemingly relatively internally consistent misinformation um, that, that um, we've all been brainwashed in. So it's rather, it's rather analogous to being, uh, to deprogramming someone who's been in a cult or something, I imagine. <laughs> you know, we've, we've all been, we're all, you know, um, uh, yeah, we're all we're all you know uh, complicit and completely mindless members of the cult of consensus reality, and we don't know it. We think that's reality. We think that's how it is, <coughs> and um, so it's a challenge to 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 perceive because. If you already think that's the way it is, what do you do about it? If someone tells you it's not that way, you say, you're wrong, it's absurd, you're crazy. 
It's like this, and at first it's like this, because I know it's like this, and everyone I know knows it's like this, so it's like this. So you're nuts, because you're telling me it's not. Um, but fortunately, it's not a matter of tit for tat. It's not a matter of hearsay. Um, one can look at directly at the nature of one's own experience, which clearly reveals its nature. Um, it's not hidden, it's not concealed in, 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 in any degree whatsoever. But typically we don't bother to. Typically we sort of take that for granted and skim over it and go right to the interpretation, go right to our narrative or our story of what's going on. And uh, we're off and running and then life sucks and what are you going to do? <coughs> So that's the nature of the problem. Um, the nature of the solution, as I said, is actually fairly simple, but it's also challenging, um, not because it itself is difficult, but because of the profound and subtle and deeply rooted entrenchment in misunderstanding that we've all been conditioned into. <coughs> And so this, uh, and again, the, the, the radical difference between the actual nature and, and the, 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 um, the brainwashed mindset, that they're so, they're so, they're so completely um, contrary that uh, it, it, um, it, it, it's it, one, you know, the initial reaction is always like, no, it can't be like that. That's wrong. It couldn't be that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm often, I'm, I'm fantasizing. So then you, you know, you look for something else. And so one undermines one's own efforts simply through disbelief in, you know, <coughs> you know, because as, as one does an investigation, there's a kind of a tendency to, check up on how one's doing with, with reference to what one already knows. And th this, is, this, is, this is contrary to this very process, to the very nature of this, because what one's investigating, um, one is so utterly contrary to what one already knows that any kind of a trying to, trying to, to check out the course of the investigation with reference to what one already knows is going to clear the deal. It's going to raised all sorts of complications and confusions um, that are unnecessary because there is utter confusion and complication with regard to comparison between actual, the actual nature and the consensus reality worldview because they're completely divergent, they're completely contrary. In fact, in many ways, it's, it's really it's kind of amusing um, to look at sort of uh, in the abstract. In many ways, a consensus reality worldview is just about 180 degrees contrary from actual from the actual condition, which is which is interesting to me. It's very peculiar that it happens to be that way, um, pretty much point for point. <laughs> um, for example, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's kind of fun. For example. In consensus reality worldview, you're a small person, you know, you're, well, you're not even a small person, you're worse than that. You're a, you're a, a tiny little ephemeral spark of consciousness. It's a byproduct of some chemical electrical reactions in your central nervous system that is an outgrowth of your body, which is a very, this tiny, small, vulnerable biological system running around this vast environment, which is basically out to eat it or kill it or crush it. Um, so what you are as a perspective is, is, is virtually nothing uh, dependent upon all of these subsystems and subsystems and subsystems which, which are progressively, you know, which are small and small and small when they're near you and vulnerable when they're near you and get vast and threatening when they go out. So there's a small little person in this vast world that is not you, that is more or less antagonistic to you or at least potentially problematic. Um, uh, and, the, and the actuality is completely the opposite. As a matter of fact, you are vast. You are everything. And the world is a small thing that appears in you. You know, it's pretty much opposite. Pretty much opposite. 
And you know, to say it like that to someone who thinks consensus reality is like, oh, that, that's nuts. <laughs> what do you mean? The world is in me. I'm bigger than the world. This is all my, you know, this is all my experience here. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, the, you know, I guess uh, in, in practice, the interesting question is, so what do you do about that? How, how can one go about investigating, discovering the true information, discovering the nature of what is actually here? and how it actually is that way. Um, which discovery will, by its very nature, invalidate one's wrong worldview and reveal one's correct situation, which, um, as it happens, will address and solve all the problems that are raised by the erroneous implications of your in inaccurate worldview that you've been brainwashed in. So how, do, how does one do that? Well, um, it's really quite simple. Look at your actual experience. Look at what your experience is, what it is um, mechanically, what it is um, existentially, um, what, just what is happening right here, right now, and the way in which it's happening. <coughs> and um, the texture of it, the its presence, its, um, its spontaneity, the fact that the present moment, all conditions in the present moment appear completely um, spontaneously in the instant without any manipulation or process or structure. Just, you know, right now everything is present exactly as it is. It doesn't need to second guess itself or ramp itself up or work itself it up to doing that, just bam, just instantaneous flash of hearingness, everything completely. Things that you're used to qualifying as objective, here. Things that you're used to qualifying as subjective, whatever light you happen to be seeing in this instant is present with exactly the same spontaneity as whatever thought you happen to think at the moment, whatever emotion you happen to be feeling at the moment, whatever sense of touch you happen to be feeling at the moment, all, everything appears instantaneously, completely, um, uh, in the moment without any process, and with absolute intimacy. And you can also notice that there is a literally infinite, you could say, bandwidth of different textures present. There's what we think of as light present with different degrees of color, different degrees of brightness. There's sound present with different degrees of frequency, different degrees of volume, and so on and so forth. There's touch present with all of its various um, ranges of difference. There's thought presence with all of its infinite ranges of different dis difference. Emotion present, you know. And then, um, if you look, you'll notice that there is also a, a, a virtually limitless, unacknowledged range of other experience present, extrasensory type experience, vibes and nuances, things that we can't, we don't have language for or words for um, in the human language because it's not part of the human game structure. You can't talk about it, so it doesn't exist in terms of what you can talk about. It's too, it's too um, ephemeral, it's too uh, insubstantial, it's too instantaneous. Um, people that do a lot of meditation become very aware of this because there's, you know, all of this clearly experiential event and qualities present that one cannot describe. You know, it's not thought in a simple sense of, oh, I'm thinking about such and such. You know, it's not, it's, it's extrasensory information, it's information that's not experiential actuality that is not qualifiable within one of the sense groups, or within mind, as we ordinarily put it. And this takes up actually the lion's share of, of experience if one's taking an inventory. Um, uh, we've become you know, very aware of this quality, these qualities of experience. For example, when we're falling asleep, you know, the, the awareness of the external environment fades, and sensory awareness fades, 
but your experience doesn't diminish. It's not like it becomes less. On the contrary, it just sort of opens into more and more of this sort of um, more <coughs> ephemeral, less form-oriented um, flavors, qualities. You know, again, language failed. But the, but the experience is completely accessible and in fact completely obvious once one tunes into it, notices that it's actually there. And, and so all, all of these ranges of experience are always present now, in the instant. Whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, whatever, whatever um, state you, you're, you qualify yourself as being in, the, the continuum of your experiential field and all of its information is always full on. Nothing gets less, nothing gets more. If you close your eyes, you, you just know less, there's no less light present in the field of vision. It just has a different character. All of a sudden, it's, it, changes, it changes from all this color and apparent, you know, sharp differentiated patterns to, to apparent little flickerings and patterns and speckles and, you know, literally countless, infinite little tiny flickers that form various patterns. But, you know, we're all very familiar with this. You close your eyes and hang out with it for a few minutes and you'll see what you see. It's not, it's, you know, it's completely obvious. But there's not any less information present when you close your eyes than when you open them. It just changes. You know, you go to sleep, there's not any less information present. All the bandwidths of experience are full. It's just the emphasis changes in terms of, of um, what seems to be um, up front and center, so to speak. You know, you go into a dream and, and, the, and the, the, there's no more or less information present. Again, the emphasis just changes and shifts around and, and juggles itself um, very fluidly, very spontaneously. <coughs> so that's, so just looking at the presence of experience, one can discover very quickly this, this nature, this fact of this, this full field that is literally infinitely differentiated with information. Another interesting quality of the field of experience is that it is, it's literally infinitely differentiated. If you take any point within the field, think, thought of, thinking of it spatially, it, what's, what's the information that's present in that point is unique and different from the, any other information presented anywhere else in the field. In other words, for example, in your visual field, anything you see at one point, you see that only there and everywhere else in, within the visual field is different. Not only that, but that point is different in the next instant because it all is continuously morphing and changing. Perhaps subtly, perhaps not so subtly, depending. Like if you're looking out the window of a bullet train, things are changing very, very rapidly and very obviously. If you're sitting alone quietly, not moving in a, in a still room, you know, this, you can think of it as nothing is changing, but in fact, if you look at your experience, it's continually changing and fluctuating and breathing and pulsing. You know, perhaps in, in, in relatively gentle, subtle ways in all this, but this, this intrinsic dynamism is discoverable because it's always true across the board. So, so your entire experience is infinitely differentiated within itself, it's infinitely differentiated it, um, as it, in, in the instant. In other words, what appears in the instant appears only then. It's never appeared before. It's never going to appear again. For example, what you're seeing right now, you've never seen before. Exactly. And you're never going to see it again. It's already gone. It's, it's bang. It's just may as well never have happened as far as any residue goes. <clears throat> Um, and this is true across the board. You know, you can you can classify sub sub fields of experience, like your visual field of experience or your auditory. You know, the, the field of hearing, the field of thought, and you'll discover these same phenomena within all of these fields, um, absolutely consistently. Um, another another thing you discover if you look is that this division of the, of the total experiential field into these subcategories is basically arbitrary. Um, there's no boundary between 
vision and hearing and thought and touch. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're intuitively and immediately obvious to differentiate, but in actual fact, you cannot, they're all, they're all essentially the same thing working in essentially the same way. They're all the presence of these instantaneous sparkles of texture. And they, they become classified according to the, the nature of that texture. So light has a particular texture that, that you can obviously and immediately <coughs> differentiate, oh, this is light, so, I'm, so I must be seeing. And sound has a different texture. So sound, you can tell sound from light because of the difference of the light texture versus the sound texture. Or you can think of it as frequency or, I mean, who knows what. Um, but if you look closely at the way light works, the way sound works, in terms of what it feels like in the instant, you'll, you'll discover you're looking at the same thing, just sort of with a slight, a slight, um, uh, a slight different emphasis, a slight different frequency, or different text, difference of texture. But the dynamism is exactly the same, the apparition is exactly the same, the differentiation is exactly the same, and ultimately it's, it becomes pretty arbitrary to distinguish them, except for this spectrum of range of, of, um, of textual difference that is found all along um, the experiential field. Or you go to the field of thought, for example, which is obviously more tenuous or more subtle or delicate than, than the textures of any of the sense fields. But again, you, if you look closely, you find exactly the same thing. It, it has, it basically presents as in a similar way as infinitely differentiated within itself, um, instantaneous, non-repeating, so on and so forth. So again, it's just a range of textures. So it's kind of like a spectrum, you know. You can look at a rainbow and you see all the colors laid out. And you can clearly see, oh, that's green and that's red and the red's not green, the green's not red, but they're all light. It's basically a continuum of the same thing that is presenting with this different way, and, you know, with this different um, apparent bandwidth. And likewise, if you look at experience, if you look at the textures, the way, the dynamism, the, the intimate immediacy of the way experience happens, you can notice that the different sense fields are very similar. It's all essentially the same thing appearing um, with, you know, um, apparent textual differentiations. They're, they're differentiable according to these textures, but it's all a continuum of the same thing appearing in the same way. You know, and this is not something to hold philosophically or to aspire to or something, but simply look and see for yourself and explore and check it out. Check out the nature of your experience and see the way this is so. Um, and in the, as, one, as one sits in this explanation, in this exploration and, and plays with it, um, you discover some other interesting things. You discover that not only is differentiation between the sense fields arbitrary and basically imaginary, but differentiation in terms of other parameters is also arbitrary and essentially imaginary. For example, subjective and objective cannot actually be found. You know? Thought appears exactly the same way as vision or touch of something supposedly objective appears, and the discriminating the one is being subjective and one is being objective, if you look at it, you'll discover there's no basis in the actual experiencing <laughs> for this differentiation. So the differentiation is imposed basically in imagination. Um, also one discovers some other, you know, other classifications that turn out to be very arbitrary. For example, um, uh, let's say uh, spontaneity versus, um, versus intentionality. So I can say, well, I can move my hand and I'm, you know, it feels like I'm doing that. I'm intending to move my hand, you know. But if I look very, very closely at the actuality of that apparition, it spontaneously appears in exactly the same way as, say, the shape of that chair spontaneously appears. And I think of myself as not, I'm not doing that chair, but I am doing 
moving my hand. But if I look very intimately at the actual instant of experiencing of the moving of the hand, the presence of the experience of the chair, the presence of the experience of so-called intentionality or thought about it or whatever, all of that just appears in experience. Um, for there to be any kind of actual intentionality, I would have to have the intention to have the intention. If having an intention just appears, then I didn't, I'm not actually doing it. It feels like an intentionality, but if it just appears, then whatever's doing the appearing is what did it, not me. And then again, of course, it gets more subtle. You go down a rabbit hole. I go looking for some supposed me that is doing it or not doing it, and nothing like that can be found. You know, because in this actual immediacy of experiential presence, where's me? You know? It's not, you know, it's not that it's not me. Um, if anything, maybe it's all me. But qualifying it, me, qualifying it in terms of meanness or not meanness, this just seems arbitrary and absurd. It just is. You know, it is. It's actual. And, you know, if it's me, okay, I am, I'm actual. You know, if it's, if it's you know... Light, okay, light is, light's actual. If it's this chair, okay, this chair is, this chair is actual. But all of these subclassifications are just throwing different names on the same present actuality of the experiential field. Um, it's like, it's like I can say, you know, this, 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 is, these are, this is my left hand, this is my both hands, this is my arms, this is my body, these are my legs, this is my toe, this is my big toe, this is my big toenail. What changed? I was just words, you know, pointing to apparent differences in a continuum of wholeness that is just present. It, you know, it's not like everything else disappears and my hand appears when I say my hand. So I say this chair, you know, the chair hasn't been actually created as a separate thing by, by describing it and naming it and, saying, and claiming that it has. I can't find a chair. All I can find is all of this. And the chair comes with. You know, the hands come with. There's just a continuum, and all of these things that we think of as subclassifications are just designations. It's like taking a picture that you've never seen before, and the picture just appears. The picture is a picture. And then you can look at the picture and say, oh, look, that's, you know, that's this and that's that and that's this and that's that and that's this in the picture. And it's a picture of my Uncle Joe. And look, he's standing next to the old car we had back then. And look, there's our dog. And it's like, no, it's just a picture. The only thing that's there is the picture. And all of these designations are just imaginary um, subcategorizations of a continuum. And it, when you designate a subcategory, you haven't actually created a separation. You know, you don't actually, it doesn't actually, I can't take this chair and lift it out of my experience and have a chair here. All that's here is my experience. And the chair is just a designation, a claim, it's a spin-doctored designation of, of something that is claimed to be there. But the chair isn't very stable. Every time I blink, it disappears. You know, I leave the room, it disappears. You know, uh, all of these subcategorizations are not reliable. They come and go. There's one thing that does not come and go, and that's the experiential field itself, actuality itself. And again, this isn't theoretical. Just, you know, look at your own experience, and this is, you know, it becomes very, very clearly obvious that uh, it is this way. <clears throat> So, um, that's just, you know, sort of a very um, small poking at some of the aspects of this great matter that we're here to investigate. Um, 
and uh, it, it can be drawn into in great depth and in enormous detail, uh, which I invite you to uh, engage in me in, in doing. Um, but it's it's really just one issue. It's it's so so simple. Um, we overcomplicate it by trying to by trying to deconstruct it when there's nothing to deconstruct. Um, the simple fact is it's a reality check. Look and see what's real. Look and see what's here. And if you look and see what's here, you ultimately will not be able to find anything other than the presence of your experiential field. Period. And trying to add to that that, oh, it's experience of this or of that will turn will reveal itself to be basically just imaginary activity within your experiential field, so it doesn't actually add to anything. It's just it's just seemingly internal elaborations and vortices within this soul presence that that exists. Um, this is completely obvious. We you know every 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 small child, every baby knows this. There's nothing present but this. <laughs> wow, here it is. <laughs> you know. And but you know, in the course of being raised, you know, of course, we're all brainwashed in. You know, oh, I'm mommy. This is daddy. You know, this is your your little you, and this is this, and this is that. And I go, oh, really? Oh. And at first, of course, the baby is just like, ah, oh. you know, it doesn't take. But eventually, just through sufficient repetition, you know, um, we get sucked in. We get caught up in this. You know, we're taught referential language. And we get caught up in the semantic spider web of the 10,000 things that, you know, you read a dictionary and every word in the dictionary is different. And, and so they each are about something that's, that's not anything else, right? Each one is it and not, you know, not any of the others. So this word means, dog means dog, and all the other words mean something else that is non-dog. And so we sort of, we have this, this vast confusing world where all of these, all of these billions of subcategorizations and what the hell are they and how do they fit together and I don't know and it all doesn't make any sense. You know, but it's all been um, created through semantic structure. It's all spin doctored into existence because the only thing actually present is the experiential feeling. <clears throat> anyway, um, that's the that's the uh, the backbone <laughs> of uh, of this issue, and I would be glad to um, discuss it with you. In terms of one's own exploration of this, um, it's very important to uh, engage in it um, honestly and personally. So be with it um, in terms of what it actually is for you in the moment and explore issues that come up for you in the moment, rather than approaching it sort of philosophically in third person and discussing it as, a, as if it was an impersonal, um, impersonal principles or something. Because it doesn't matter. All that really matters is what it is to you. <laughs> it's not anything <laughs> out there as far as, you know, as far as uh, you're concerned. <clears throat> The, you know, the real bottom line, the real basic, basic um, gist of it is really just a reality check, just to settle into the, the basic fact of this is the way it is, and then check out exactly how that is and what it is and the way that that is for yourself rather than taking it on hearsay or third hand or whatever, you know, or out of pop culture or out of the news or out of a, a textbook or out of what your parents taught you or out of anything. It's like, look for yourself. Because it may well be that you've been fed a, a pack of 
yeah. or shall we say, uh, inaccuracies <laughs> as the hearsay version of what of what things are, what's going on. And so, um, it's really, in essence, the essence of all of this spiritual stuff and all of this is really just a reality check of get real, you know. Here this is, here you are, check it out, you know, what's what's going on, what's happening, what what's really here, and how is it the way that it is, and, and, and what's up with all of that, you know, I mean, it really couldn't be simpler, um, if it wasn't so, you know, as we spoke uh, in some depth about yesterday, if it wasn't so um, peculiar and slippery in the way that it is, but the peculiarness and slipperiness that it, that it, that it um, clearly embodies is objectively discoverable. It's, it's here, it's obvious. So again, that's just more, just check it out. So, you know, what could be simpler? <laughs> One of the primary characteristics of actuality is its very nature is to appear to split off from itself uh, infinitely without ever actually doing so, without ever actually becoming different than itself, without ever actually departing itself or leaving itself. This very, very curious phenomena is um, the basic reason why um, it, spirituality is uh, or can be um, let's, let's say generally seems to be <laughs> so challenging and such a um, uh, such a, uh, a daunting enterprise because to to find to, to identify actuality clearly um, is uh, one is confronted by this continual variation um, from any norm, from any condition, from any um, any way in which it seems to be whatsoever. <coughs> um, and <coughs> so it's. Um, What can I say about that? <laughs> it is possible, it is easy to mistake it in its nature um, And yet, even that mistaking it ultimately is its nature. <clears throat> so, it it is by its very nature an infinite subtlety, um, which befuddles identification. <clears throat> and yet, identification is of the essence, identifying what this is, is the essential point. Um, which seems very strange and peculiar and paradoxical because it's everything. So one would think that anything one identifies is it, and that is actually the truth. But to see the way in which that's so <laughs> is where the subtlety comes into it. Um, This is basically why, um, a, you know, uh, uh, an authentic spiritual teacher is um, so useful. <clears throat> because when, when one gets down to the fine points, um, It can it can be easy to split hairs and, and mis misidentify. <clears throat> so 
Someone's making a lot of noise. Whoever you are, if you could try to mute your... Oh, it's a telephone. Let me do this. There we go. Sorry. <clears throat> um, what illustrates the, this point is actually this talk this morning so far illustrates it rather nicely. It's been a completely rambling, incoherent, essentially useless <laughs> dissertation and yet is profoundly true and profoundly relevant. <laughs> and it would require a spiritual master to point out the way in which that's so. <laughs> um, the, you know, the very, the very strange thing is how, because of the very nature of what this is, how easy it is um, for it to misidentify itself. And this is the root of, of you know, any spiritual problems that seem to exist uh, in here and that. It, that's the reason why they can, that can seem to be a problem. And so, of course, clear identification is a solution. Um, So, oh, no. <laughs> so, good evening. Don't think I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tonight I'm going to talk about identification. Identification is a central issue in yoga. <laughs> yoga is a word for for the process of of. Um, investigating the nature of actuality and ultimately through the process of yoga coming to discover what it is. Um, uh, and identification is a key point in this. Um, of course, we're all very familiar with identification, you know, so most people identify with my body or identify with, you know, my, my, my social station and my history and so on and so forth. Um, but identification also has a more basic and fundamental level, um, which is um, uh, to identify anything as actually being a certain way. You know, this is a computer, this is a mug of chai, and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the principle of both of those is actually the same. Um, In, in one sense, in a very profound sense, identification is the, is the cause of the spiritual problem, or I should say misidentification. Um, we, we, we are taught to identify largely through sort of brainwashing by our parents and by society and so on and so forth, where, you know, when, when of course, when you're a newborn, you don't know anything from anything. It's just, ah, you know, just <laughs> here, <laughs> is. <laughs> And then, of course, you know, through the protracted process of over the next few years, you know, your parents are busy telling you, hi, mommy, this is daddy, you know, you're little Peter, and then this is, you know, this is your room, and this is your house, and this is, a, you know, and of course, as an innocent baby, you just sort of go along with the program, oh, great, I'm Peter, you know, this is my room, you know, and so I'm, you know, you, you, you buy it hook, line, and sinker because you don't have a basis to criticize it or... or any kind of a notion that there's anything to criticize there. <coughs> Which is all fine, but there's not really a problem with, with that. And the problem isn't so much the identification, the problem is being careless with the nature of identification um, in terms of naming. And there's nothing wrong with naming things um, as a designation. You know, a name is like a URL of a website on, online, you know, it's, it's just an address, it's a designation. I say, you know, this is a cup of chai, you know, that's a way of, of designating this object, um, if I just use it as a designation. But if, then if I think, if this is a cup of chai, that's what it is, it's a cup of chai, it's no more, no less, that, that encompasses the entirety of its being, then that's... Um, using naming um, 
to define it. So that you could, you could, I mean, if you want to look at it sort of technically in terms of linguistics, you could say that that um, um, there's two ways to use words. One is to use words referentially, and another is to use words definitively. Referentially, you're just referring to things. You know, um, you know, I point in the sky and say that's a cloud. I don't know, I don't know anything about it, what it is, anything, but I'm designating that unknown presence as that cloud. But if I say that is a cloud, and then I think that I know what that means, I'm, I'm, I, that's where identification seeps in, because then I think that I, I think that that is a cloud, and all of a sudden I know everything about it. Um, of course, I don't really know everything about it, but I may not pay close attention to the fact that I don't and think that I do. Oh, it's just a cloud, it's water vapor in the air, you know, it's a boring, who cares, you know, blah, blah, move on. <coughs> and it's this mode of defining, thinking, thinking that one has defined things that are designated that causes identification. <coughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with identification except that it's wrong. It's just inaccurate. Nothing is what you can think that it is. Everything is literally unthinkable. Everything, anything whatsoever cannot be conceived, cannot be thought. Because everything is infinite. Not in a theoretical sense or a philosophical sense, but literally, experientially infinite, physically infinite, infinite in every and any way you could look at things. <coughs> um, so you can't get to the bottom of what anything is. You can't exhaustively know everything about anything. You know, I mean, it's kind of self-evident if you think about it. But we don't usually think about it, and we don't usually, people in general, don't usually notice that fact and think about it and think, well, I know, I know what you know. I know what a computer is. I know what a car is. I know what a room is. I know what a body is. I know what you know, space is, I know what time is, I know what, you know, the sun is. Really? You know, no one really knows what any of those things actually are. It can't be known because you'll never get to the bottom of what it is. You know, scientists can study the sun, you know, for millions and millions of years, assuming, let's assume that humans continue to survive and or evolve into other species, whatever, but this Suppose that science went on unbroken. They'd studied the sun for millions and millions of years. They'd be continually making new discoveries. They'd be continually discovering new aspects and new nuances that they hadn't noticed before. It would, and they'd never, you'd never get to the bottom. They'd never get to a point where, now we know everything there is to know about the sun. Now, <laughs> see all this information here? That's what the sun is. Never going to happen. Because the sun is literally infinite. You know, everything is infinite. The dust on the floor is infinite, you know. The, 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 a particular thread in your pants is infinite, you know. Anything and everything is infinite. Um, coming to notice this directly, and not theoretically or philosophically, but coming to see the way that this is actually so experientially is, is of the essence of yoga and is a very powerful practical principle um, that you can actually work with that um, facilitates the discovery of what is actually here, what you actually are. <coughs> um, the advantage of that being it frees you from error, it frees you from basically insanity, where you think you know what things are and you're completely wrong and you don't know you're wrong. You're just you're like a crazy person in that case. You know, you'd be walking around, living in a world of your fantasy, thinking it actually existed, um, and it doesn't. <laughs> so, in a in a profound sense, yoga could be said to be um, a, a, an antidote for insanity and, and a, a process of of attempting to enter into sanity, attempting to enter into clearly seeing what 
it actually is the way that it actually is and so on and so forth <coughs> so this little principle of identification um, is key to coming to see this um, so if you take a survey of what is present you know the, the you know an identified way might be you know you, you could make an exhaustive list of well my body is present and this room is present and Sam Rafael is present and all these people are present the chairs are present the floors you know blah 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 you know hours and hours and hours later you have this this massively huge list with all of this all of this this names and words on it or yogic way you could say what is present you know this that that I could call my body seems to be present that is present you know um, what I could call thought seems to be present what I could call light seems to be present what I could call sound seems to be present what I could call all sorts of subtle energies and subtle vibes and moods and what have you seems to be present and so on and so forth and all of these presences are simply being indicated, pointed out, pointed to, by these ways of designating them, rather than being defined by it. I don't know what this is, but I'll call it my body. You know, it's present. The body is, pre is no more present than, you know, uh, the room. It's present in experience exactly the same way. Um, you know, so that the more heavy-handed kind of identification, ego identification of, oh, what is me? Me can't really be found. Me is an accident of over-identifying. You know, well, this is here, and this is more here. This really matters more than that that is here, even though the, the here-ness that they have is precisely the same. You know, my hand appears in my field of vision exactly like that light appears in my field of vision. The hand has no privileged position in my field of vision, so on and so forth. And the same with, um, you know, anything and everything that could be designated. The all experiential characteristics, let's call them, are present equally with exactly the same presence. Nothing has a privileged position. Nothing is special or or unspecial for that matter. Um, and looking at the way, you know, directly perceiving, directly feeling, directly knowing the way that that is so, is noticing your genuine being, noticing your genuine experience. Um, and one of the things that's very apparent is that it is, it appears to be the way it appears to be, but you can't pin down precisely how many of it is, because a, because it's too much information, B, because it's too variable, and in C, because it's too diversified. You know, I look at this, I look at a, a jacket here, I can say, that jacket is blue, you know? But if I look at the, the actual colors, the experience of the colors of that jacket, every point of that jacket is a different shade than every other point, you know? And a point doesn't have a fixed size, so if I look at, if I take a point and say, that's a point and that's a particular color, and I divide that point in two, that made it, you know, looks closer, each of those points would be a different color and so on and so forth. So there's an infinity of shades of blue in that jacket and I'm doing myself a disservice to say, oh no, it's just a blue jacket. I'm censoring the richness and open-endedness of my experience by dumbing it down and saying it was just blue. I mean, it's like, it's like politicians do, you know. They're, they're evil, you know, or this is, you know, the, you take this incredibly complex, subtle array of, of information and characteristics and characterize it as in a, in a simple sound bite and then, and then, and then, you know, demonize it or, or deify it, you know, which is, it's doing a disservice to actuality. It's doing a disservice to what's actually here. And if, if one does that to oneself, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're 
cutting yourself off from letting yourself notice and appreciate the richness and the liveliness and the vitality of what your experience actually is. <coughs> and contrarily, if you are fully and clearly engaged with the richness and the dynamism that you actually are anyway, um, you have the joy and the, and, the, and the exquisite, amazing characteristics of that um, to enjoy. You have that anyway. You can't not have that. But it's a kind of a hypnosis of not letting yourself notice it, which is what all this heavy-handed identification does. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a censorship of one's own experience. It's not an effective censorship, because in fact, the infinity is always there. It can't go away. You know, even if I say that's just a blue jacket, it still is all these incredible shades. I'm just, I'm just not letting myself appreciate that, and, you know, and and notice it. So, in a sense, practically, I cut myself off from that actuality of how infinite and dynamic it is. <coughs> And then, especially so with the you know the more heavy-handed kind of identification, where I identify myself. You know, this is me. That everything else is not me. This body is me. You know, this is my cup. This is my computer. You know, that's not my cup. You know, <laughs> all, all the all the the mine and not mine, the me and not me, that we're all so familiar with as normal human psychological modes. Um, it's, it's completely imposed on experience. Experience doesn't say, doesn't come intrinsically saying what it is. This computer doesn't say it's mine. Doesn't say it's not mine. It's, it's not a it's not a category that has any meaning whatsoever. This body doesn't say it's mine. Doesn't say it's not mine. It's just a, a, an apparition, you know. And the, uh, it's exactly the same kind of apparition as any apparition. All apparitions exactly the same. It's all just presence. It's all just experiential qualities that are miraculously, um, spontaneously present. And the way in which that is present and the miraculousness of that presence um, becomes clear and becomes revealed when one lets oneself notice it through letting go of all of this heavy-handed identification that people are typically so caught up in. <clears throat> It's interesting um, using words to as a vehicle for sharing that which cannot be conceptualized, that which cannot be <laughs> put into words. Um, of course, the, that's um, actually workable because what words are, what language is, isn't what it pretends to be within by its own lights by its own internal definitions. <clears throat> um, language, you, you could think of language as existing on two levels, kind of like a Trojan horse. And in the Trojan horse, of course, the, uh, the horse was this nice big sculpture or whatever on the outside, but, but inside there was all of these soldiers hidden. So it was it was it was accomplishing two things at, at once on two different levels that didn't have a lot to do with each other and you would miss the point if you were taken in by the level of the horse itself as of course the trojans supposedly were and missed the point of the <laughs> the soldiers hidden within it so of course language uh Language has its own internal definitions of itself and structure and um, um, words have definitions and the, 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 the notion, the logical notion that has its own logic and the, the notion that words are supposed to refer to things and conditions on a more or less one-to-one -one basis and so on and so forth. And of course, this is not really true because the actual condition that exists um, does not, cannot be, uh, be made to correspond on any kind of one-to-one -one basis whatsoever with um, 
with, with language and words and the structure of language. Um, <clears throat> and, and yet there is this other, this sort of second level of language which is language is actual functioning, which and it has always been language is actual functioning, whether or not this has been acknowledged. Um, some solar phenomena going on here. <laughs> um, there's this language itself is, of course, an expression of. being, an expression of beings, an expression of the life force, an expression of, of reality itself, and as such um, actually conforms to that nature and that structure. Let's see, there we go. Um, which is not the structure that language pretends to conform to by its own internal logic. Intelligent people have always known this. Intelligent people tend to be careless of their language and, and, are, and are very free to use language in convenient ways with, with, a, with, a, um, uh, uh, you know, with a, a, a free and easy <laughs> disregard for factuality and such, because the point of language, of course, is to communicate meaning. Um, and meaning, by its very nature, is irrational, is not um, bound by uh, narrow definitions and narrow structure. <clears throat> so because of this, um, it's quite possible and workable to use language um, for this as a medium for this spiritual investigation, even though by its own um, internal orientation, uh, this is <laughs> it shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't. It shouldn't work. <clears throat> so you know, in in building on this. Um, the, the basic nature of, com of coming to understand spirituality is coming to understand irrationality, coming to understand the, the actual nature and inherent, um, call it structurality or organization of actuality itself, as opposed to any kind of a logical structure or a logical um, rational um, organization or analysis, which normal human thought um, uh, tends to inculcate. <clears throat> and of course, it, this isn't that hard to do because experience by its very nature is fundamentally irrational. It is this presence exactly the way that it is um, that is completely and negatively revealed to the experiencer, and nothing but that. Um, and um, it's, 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 it's very plain and very obvious to, to even um, uh, superficial investigation that what this is can, does not correspond, it cannot be captured in linear ideas or in simple notions or in, in, in rational logical structures um, with any accuracy at all. Uh, and it, in, it's, it's in the nature of spirituality, it's in the nature of the work of the yogi to look and see more precisely the way in which that's so and the range uh, um, uh, that that is the case, the range of the way that that is the case. Of course, the overarching uh, um, principle of yoga is that your experience is not what you think it is. Um, so just explore it and and investigate it and let it show you what it actually is and, and um, you'll discover what it is and discover what you are, which is wildly and radically contrary to 
um, any human conceptualization of what that is. This that is here is the natural condition. It's the soul condition. In fact, it's the actual condition. Um, all of spirituality, all of yoga, in fact, all of life, is about discovering this condition um, and discovering that you actually are this condition, that this condition includes every and anything that is actual. <coughs> <clears throat> this condition is uh, to someone who is steeped in a normal human mindset this condition can be difficult and challenging to investigate and to discover uh, because it is not uh, the, the way in which it is what it is is not um, uh, does not conform with our normal human idea of things or of conditions or of um, any kind of an object you know I have this uh, this is a glass and I, it's sort of an object and it's clearly apparent as an object and it can be um, related to in various ways and so on and so forth whereas this that is here this that the glass actually consists of and that the glass consists in consists of um, is much more subtle is much more strange it cannot be um, found or grasped or looked at as a simple object relative to other objects or re or even relative to itself <clears throat> because its very nature is it, it, it partakes of all sorts of peculiar qualities in particular, it's absolutely unresolvable. It's absolutely instantaneous. Um, it's absolutely, uh, uh, you could say, changeful, or uh, uh, absolutely um, unstable. And um, <clears throat> all, of, all of which qualities um, in Buddhism is summed up under the notion emptiness. In other words, it's empty of any quality that you can use as a handle to orient towards it or to seize it or to grasp it or to as a parameter that it consists of and yet it is the sole actual it's the sole actuality it's the sole actual condition so any any actuality that is experienced is it and nothing other than it and the way in which that actuality is experienced is it its mode its method its it's dynamism, you could say. It's behavior, if you will. <clears throat> so this natural condition, this very peculiar natural condition, which alone exists, um, is what all the fuss is about. And it's very paradoxical, because it's completely obvious. In fact, you've never known anything whatsoever, <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's impossible to. <laughs> and yet, it's very, very easy to overlook or to misinterpret, because of its very peculiar nature, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis our normal human way of thinking about things and conditions and actions and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, Um, other than that, <laughs> all of yoga, all of spirituality, all of um, uh, living life really has to do with, well, so, how, so what do you do? So what? So how do you do this investigation? How do you do this, this um, uh, exploration of this astounding, miraculous condition? And um, unfortunately, one has to basically stumble onto it or discover it for oneself uh, in terms of the actual, the actuality of how to engage with it. Um, fortunately, it is, you know, for those of sufficient 
um, intelligence or intuition or what have you. Um, karmic readiness, you might say, if you're <laughs> so disposed. <laughs> um, it is possible to, you know, come to uh, a meeting like this and and discuss it and talk about it and perhaps scratch obliquely at various aspects of engagement and, and discovery and uh, essentially coming to notice and appreciate that this condition is what it is and the way that it is what it is. As one comes to see this more and more clearly, one discovers that this is oneself, this is one's actual nature, and then the, 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 the peculiar condition known as uh, self-realization um, is discovered to be um, one's nature, is discovered to be uh, what <laughs> is occurring here. It's essential for someone trying to enter the path of yoga to learn to distinguish between orienting to the content of experience, which is the normal human mode, to um, investigating experience itself, which in the normal human mode of orientation is taken for granted, <clears throat> uh, is not is just considered to be a given, a, a sort of an abstract metaphysical. <laughs> given that is of, of no interest and one becomes very interested in the apparent circumstances that are appearing which are held to be about one's objective environment, about the world, about the state of oneself, about one's orientation to all that and then one becomes more, typically more or less heavily invested in winning or losing or at least battling the human game. <coughs> but the yogi, on the other hand, investigates experience itself. What is this experience? And of course this is very subtle because uh, it's, it's, it, it's impossible to extricate experience from the fact that experience presents as all of this apparent um, objectification, all of this apparent um, qualitative patterns that appear um, within experience. <clears throat> so the trick is to learn to see experience in terms of that which is the substance of these patterns which are appearing and also that of course which is um, the the medium and the and the the motive force that is um, uh, making all of these patterns appear <clears throat> so the pattern all the patterning becomes the vehicle through which one explores experience itself but not by orienting to the patterns in their own terms, but by orienting to the way in which they appear, the way in which um, their, their presence, their dynamism, um, their unresolvability, and so on and so forth, <coughs> which is examinable because, of course, um, all of these experiential qualities, of course, completely <laughs> fulfill the experiential field. <coughs> um, Another challenge with looking at uh, experience itself uh, is it, it's, it cannot, it, it can, one cannot get outside it to look at it from outside. And the, typically within yoga, although not, not entirely, but typically within yoga, the dominant inquiry is, is affected within the waking state. Um, and the waking state has some interesting dominant characteristics, um, particularly uh, curiosity and a critical faculty where one can, can assess the quality of what's being experienced in various ways. The dream state lacks this um, predominantly. The dream state is a state typically of credulity where there's not much of a critical faculty present. Um, on the other hand, the dream state has the advantage of, of being of being analyzable from outside because one can recall to various extents or, or recreate from to various in various ways the dream state from the perspective of the waking state which does have this predominant um, faculty of, of a critical 
uh, a critical faculty or an analytical faculty, um, which can be useful in getting a sense of what a dream is like. From within a dream, a dream is not obviously a dream. A dream seems like a waking state. And the waking state, in fact, is very similar, although it's hard to demonstrate that because it, 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 it's virtually impossible to look at the waking state from outside it. Not virtually impossible, but in, in terms of, in terms of uh, let's say, normal human orientation, it's uh, extremely difficult. <coughs> um, one, one, uh, one technique here, one opportunity here, is that while from within the waking state um, one has access to dimensions of experience that are not actually of the waking state, to transcend the waking state. Um, <coughs> uh, a, a lot of, um, you know, uh, there, there are many experiential realms that are, or portions of bandwidth, let's call it, that are outside of sensory experience, outside of conscious um, uh, uh, you know, narrative, interpretive, uh, thought uh, that are that are simultaneously present, um, you know, and and humans are very aware of this. We we you know artists, for example, dip into these nonlinear, irrational modes, um, and and virtually everyone does um, in various ways through various kinds of emotionality and so on and so forth. But a yogi can very specifically and and, and more or less uh, intentionally explore these non-sensory, these non-waking state dimensions of experience that are immediately present from within the waking state, thereby gaining um, experience that's outside the waking state. Now, these other dimensions partake of a quality of intelligence, or let's say qualities of intelligence that are not like the, the analytical and critical faculty that is... Um, dominate within the waking state. But nonetheless, uh, these, these modes of intelligence are, are uh, profound in being able to, uh, being vehicles for uh, arriving at insight about the nature of the waking state. Um, and so it's predominantly through exploring these, the perspective of these uh, transpersonal experiential dimensions from the waking state, as well as exploring the texture and um, dynamism of um, normal experiential patterns that are appearing within the waking state, um, this sort of two-pronged attack, two-pronged mode is the, um, the, 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 perhaps the chief vehicles for the yogi to um, affect uh, exploration. I thought tonight I'd talk about um, uh, kind of a very simple aspect of this, but it's very um, immediate, which is um, actually uh, which is actually a cardinal turning point in terms of in terms of liberation, in terms of um, feeling contented, feeling um, safe in, uh, in one's experience. Um, in, uh, obviously, a normal, in a normal world view, people think they're identified with their body and you live alone in this world and you're in your body and you're subject to the world and the world is out there and you're not connected from it and you're vulnerable to it and um, it's, a, it's a potentially precarious situation. And, and so there's an inherent sort of an insecurity and vulnerability, just a feeling tone in the background of that, easily, you know, for, for if, if one's settled into a normal human worldview. But um, if, if, if you explore your experience and feel it, feel how your experience is sitting right here, feel how your experience, just the feeling tone of your experience doesn't really have an edge and it's actually settled in and integrated within whatever it is that it's in. Um, 
perhaps we're most familiar with this kind of an experience um, in going to sleep. When, when, uh, when obviously when you settle down to go to sleep, there's a letting go and letting, you know, sort of melting into this big pool of darkness, a pool of all of this sort of openness. And it's a sense of boundaries dissolving. It's not a sense of, you know, of being contained or being partial. On the contrary, it's a sense of sort of melting into an oceanic feeling of completeness. And it's um, very easy to experience that in the waking state as well. Um, you know, again, we've all been brainwashed in the identifying with our bodies as being the separate individual entities that we're dependent upon living in this separate environment that we're vulnerable to. But if you look at your actual experience right here, you can see, well, here's the sense fields. You know, here's this, the feeling of my body. You know, here's, you know, my, my, the field of my thought, the field of emotion, all these feelings. All these fields of experience floating right here. What are they floating in? They don't have a hard edge. They don't have a wall at a point where they stop. They're sort of floating in a rich, sort of a, you know, maybe a darkness, a field of, of some kind that they are embedded in and they're one with. There's no, you know, again, there's, if, you, if you feel the, 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 um, the expanse of your experience, it doesn't have an edge, it doesn't have a, a bottom or a top. It just, it's just a, it's a uniform fullness without boundary, without an ending very much like we feel explicitly when we go to sleep. But if, if you take the time to notice, you can notice that's the case in the waking condition too. And, and this is a true feeling, the feeling of being integrated in being, being, you know, you are an outgrowth of being and you include the being that you're an outgrowth of. It's not like being is here and it stops somewhere and then you start. On the contrary, being is a continuum and your being, the personal being, no matter how, 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 you know, focused you 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 pull in on it, even that focused being is in the continuum of being, and it's the same being. It's not like there's my being and then this being. You know, if I feel it, it's all a continuum, an exclusive continuum of being. And this is not a matter of logic or argument or rationality. But it's, it's very easy to feel the way that this is so. And this is a very simple kind of a meditation that um, actually uh, points out and, and leads to um, some of the most profound aspects of spirituality. It leads to the, the inclusiveness of presence, the inclusiveness of being, and that your being, your presence, is one with all being and all presence, which, uh, you know, which, which eliminates the feeling tone of vulnerability, the feeling tone of isolation, the feeling tone of dependency, and, and opens to a feeling tone of fullness and lusciousness and um, um, being beyond time, being uh, independent of circumstance, so that even, even as challenging circumstances arrive, arise, there's not this, there's not this knee-jerk panic of, oh my god, this is terrible, everything's going to, you know, the shit's really going to hit the fan. It's more like, well, okay, this is a problem, and you know, you work with it. But it's not like you're going to actually lose anything, because this fullness of being that you are doesn't go anywhere. It's not dependent upon things being a certain way. It's not dependent upon needing to be successful or needing to have things go your way or anything. Because the, the continuum of being, the fullness of the background of being and the foreground of being and everything, just as this one field, is really explicitly obvious. Um, and it's, it's relatively easy to, you know, every now and then take the time to just feel the way this is so uh, and um, become familiar with it, familiarize yourself with the way this is so. Uh, and uh, this, this really uh, profoundly can transform um, the sense of vulnerability and separation and so on and so forth. And also it it leads it indicates and leads to a revelation of the most profound spirituality, which is that you are everything, everything is you. You know, uh, in, in literally, in, in a pretty profound, literal, immediate sense. Um, not just some theoretical, poetic 
meta, metaphorical metaphysics. <laughs> and so this is this is the very essence of realization. This is the very essence of of yoga achievement of uh, of spiritual uh, realization. <coughs> and it's very simple and immediate and mundane and not theoretical. It's just a matter of feeling the presence of your experience and, and the way its presence is a, a, a continuum. Its presence is an inclusive continuum that is one with all being. The fundamental fact is basically that all human knowledge and ideas about the nature of what actuality is, of what's going on here, um, are inaccurate. Um, so it behooves anyone that wishes to um, make any headway in investigating what's actually going on here, what one's actual situation is, what one's nature, the nature of one's being is, the nature of the being of the, the field of reality is, and so on and so forth, um, it behooves one to um, ignore <laughs> the, the, the precedent set by all of the enormous body of knowledge um, that, you know, people have uh, accumulated in terms of ideas and interpretations about what's actually happening here. Um, the fundamental reason why these accurate, these, these ideas are inaccurate um, is that what is happening here cannot be captured accurately um, through concepts, through symbols, through any kind of logical mapping, and so on and so forth. It's intrinsic to the nature of what this is that that is the case. Um, the only way that it can be ascertained is directly, and its nature can be ascertained, and its properties can be ascertained, is directly and irrationally. Now, fortunately, this is very easy to do because the very nature of your being is such, happens to be such that um, you have direct engagement with the field of actuality. And it also happens that its irrational nature is one with your irrational nature. So you, you, you have, um, you have the, the necessary uh, um, uh, mechanisms and uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, paradigms of knowledge to assimilate it. Um, <coughs> but as long as one insists on trying to correlate the nature of reality with, with normal human um, philosophies and theories and so on and so forth, one is doomed to be, uh, uh, to be confused and to be... Uh, <laughs> Made made dizzy dizzy <laughs> with uh, with uh, the the incoherence of what is actually here by comparison with any human or normal version of what it supposedly is. <clears throat> um, of course, the method of yoga is very very simple. Um, let reality show you what it is. Uh, and it does so very directly uh, and very fully. Uh, the only, again, the only caveat is uh, if you have preconceptions of what it is you're looking for or what you expect to find, those are going to get in the way and inhibit your noticing of what is actually present. Um, I expect uh, uh, you all... Um, certainly, certainly, most of you all, if not the entirety of you all, have, are, are somewhat familiar with um, my presentation. So this is probably not um, new ground for you. One extremely easy and obvious way to get your your, your foot in the door, so to speak, of yoga is to simply notice the fact that. Your experience, the, the experiencing of your experience is not personal. You're not doing it. You're not seeing 
your field of vision. You are not hearing the sounds that are here. It's not something you do by, you don't decide to see your field of vision. You can't stop seeing your field of vision. You can't make it, you couldn't shut it off if you wanted to. You can't shut off the sense of touch. You can't stop um, the sense of hearing. You cannot stop thinking. You cannot stop the presence of all of these experiential phenomena. Um, and yet it is the fact that these are being experienced is very obvious, very immediate. You could say it feels very personal and uh, gives rise to what we're all very familiar with, the sense of me. Oh, I'm sure I'm here. I'm seeing my experience. I'm doing this. I'm talking. I'm moving my hand. But again, if you look very closely, you'll notice what is really doing that. So I'm talking, but where are these words coming from? Well, I can say, well, I'm thinking the words, and so I'm saying them. But, okay, I'm thinking the words, so am I grabbing words out of a bin and putting them in my mind to think them? Is, it, is there some process that I personally am initiating, picking and choosing what thought is going to occur um, hands-on? Or is it just it, at, cer at a certain point, I mean, there can be a sense of participation. Oh, yeah, you know, I, there's thought happening, and there's some kind of a, there's some kind of a, of a participatory engagement that can even feel like some kind of a steering. But but, uh, if I look at, at that entire process, ultimately there's a point where it just emerges. It just appears. Even if I'm censoring or stifling myself, even if I feel like yelling and screaming and jumping around the room and cursing or something, and I don't. Where does, that, where does that sense of stifling come from? Where does that sense of censorship come from? At some point, it just shows up. It just appears. It's, you know, it's not something that um, can be found to be being personally done. And um, this is very obvious and very immediate um, to see. And this, of course, what's actually doing it is radiance. What's actually doing it is the dynamic, the, the dynamic apparent expression, apparent apparition of reality itself. Um, so what is seeing my field of vision right now? You know, it's right here. It's a com it couldn't be more immediate. It couldn't be more personal. But it's completely and utterly transcendental, intrinsically in what it is. Um, so what is seeing experience? What is thinking thought? You know, what is um, what is saying words? What is having motivations? What is wanting to take a drink and taste the flavor of it? And we're used to answering, "Well, I am. I'm doing that." <clears throat> but if you look again, if you look very closely. And it's really quite obvious. You don't even have to look that closely. And all of these phenomena, they just appear mysteriously from nowhere. And this is radiant presence. It is literally what I refer to as this, this um, uh, beguiling phrase <laughs> or befuddling phrase, radiant presence. This, that is just, it is here, it is present, and it appears as in the way that it does, dynamically, as whatever it, it appears. It appears as a field of vision. It appears as apparent thought. It appears as perception. It appears as motivation. It appears as, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so right away, um, in this yoga, it's a very, very simple um, field of engagement. Well, where is this transcendental radiant presence? Where do I look for it? Well, right here. You know, what? what is doing experience? Literally, what is doing it? And if, I, if, I, if it feels like I'm doing it, again, just look closely at exactly what I mean by this word I. Ultimately, it's true. You could say, yeah, I, I am doing it, but the I that's doing it is the I that exists, which is Act, the actuality of radiant presence. It's not Peter Brown. It's not this body. It's not this central nervous system. 
it's a mis it's a it's a a fundamental apparition of the absolute radical core essence of reality itself, which is right here, right now, appearing as all of this. <clears throat> you know, and this is really, really quite obvious if you look at it. Just look at what's, you know, what is looking out of your eyes, what's seeing your field of vision. Um, and right away you can get your foot in the door that way. So that's kind of a subjective approach. Or you can play with an objective approach. So what is being seen? So, you know, light is being seen. What is this light? Where is this light? What's the nature of this light? And again, if you look at this light, you'll discover it's, it's completely actual, it's completely concrete, you might say. And yet, it's very, very strange. It, it only exists in the instant. It's absolutely dynamic. It's absolutely unresolvable. It presents as these in inconceivably infinite fractal patternings that, again, have this absolute instability. And this, again, this is all very obvious um, as a result of simply looking more closely at what is actually here and the way that it is actually here, as opposed to just the usual ignorant assumption that you know what it is. Oh, I'm seeing my room. I'm seeing my computer. You know, but if you look more closely, what do I what do I mean by a room? What do I mean by a computer? And you get into this the nature of this this actual apparition. And what is this apparition? You know, how is it appearing? What is seeing it? What's experiencing it? Where is it appearing? And again, all of these all of these questions, all of these jumping off points of investigation, reveal themselves as completely unanswerable. Um, in, immediately and obviously and clearly and palpably unanswerable because of the intrinsically transcendental nature of what everything and anything is. There is no normal, there is no dull, there is no you know, mechanical, there is no um, commonplace. Or you could say everything is commonplace, but what is this everything that is commonplace is absolutely transcendental, what I call radiant presence, this actuality that is here, that is completely um, unresolvable. <clears throat>